You know, we're often told, oh, you got sick because you were stressed. But I wasn't stressed. I can honestly say at the age of 39, I felt myself to be at a peak in my life. And I felt very fulfilled. I was very much at peace, and I, I was at home in my own skin. And so you can imagine that it was the last thing I ever expected to have happen, is for my own tummy to start to grow. And there was one day that I was sitting for meditation, and I so much didn't want to believe it could be happening to me, not when supposedly I was doing everything right. Because of course, in getting certified in all these fields and also being a, a therapist also in life, you got to know I was doing work on myself all the time. I, I'd go to all the, the hundreds of seminars, and, and I was always clearing, always facing my own issues. And, and, and I, I'll be a student, truthfully, till the day I die. And this one day, I was meditating. And I'd been meditating since I was at university. I first learned to meditate. So this was no different than any other time. And I don't know, how many of you meditate, actually? Oh, great. A great number of you do meditate. Well, you know how it can happen when you're meditating? That it's like your mind, it starts to wind down. And it falls into the background. And I just got left in this bath of stillness, of peace, of wordless stillness. And out of nowhere came a gut knowing that I might be seriously ill. And I need to get real and get myself to an orthodox medical doctor to have all the tests done that are available today. And when I came out of that, that meditation, just waves of shame came flooding over me. And I thought, what a fraud, Brandon, you are. What a fraud. Here you're certified in all these fields. You travel around the world teaching living health, and that was with Tony Robbins at that time. And so I would give a seminar for 6,000 people, teaching them how to, how to breathe and how, what kind of food was vibrant for your, your uh, health, what cleansed the, the, the bloodstream instead of clogged it, you know? And I came out of this meditation, and just this waves of shame came flooding over me. And I thought, what a fraud. Here you're doing everything you believe in. And you might be seriously ill. And so I was too chicken to call my own best friend up, who was going to the kind of medical specialist that I need to go to. And instead, I did the chicken's way out, and I went to the local Barnes & Noble bookshop. And I found a book there written by a surgeon who did not advocate hysterectomies, and I'd seen where the weight gain was. And I called the number at the back of the book. And when I spoke to the nurse, she talked to me like I was ignorant, which I was. And she said, do you know who this medical doctor is, this surgeon? She works for the California State Board of Medicine. She couldn't see you for six, maybe eight months. And I said, I didn't know that. I, I just picked up a book. And I said, listen, if there's any cancellations, can you call me? And I got off the phone, and once again, it was just the waves of shame that here I was, having done all this work, teaching all these people how to create vibrant health. And I might be seriously ill. And three days later, I was so grateful. The nurse called me back. She says, you're not going to believe this, but there was a cancellation. And she said, would you like it? It's in a couple months' time. So, yes, please. And I didn't know, but the nature of that tumor was that it grows exponentially at a very aggressive, accelerated rate. So by the time I got there, I looked about six months pregnant, although I knew that that wasn't true. And I'm not going to go through the whole graphic description of what happened, but she at the end of the examination, which was very thorough, she said to me, Brandon, you are equivalent to six months pregnant with a tumor that's the size of a basketball. 
And you would have thought, with my whole background being in health and certified in all these various fields, that maybe I would have received that news with a little bit of calm. But I'm going to tell you the truth. I was terrified. My heart was pounding through the roof, you know. My mind was spinning out. And she said, not only that, but you're bleeding internally. We need to have the further test done. We need to find out, is this malignant or is it benign? But it's not going to matter. It's crushing the rest of your organs. Haven't you noticed you can't breathe? And I said, yeah. And I said, I thought that was the extra weight gain. She said, no, it's because the tumor is now pushing into your diaphragm. And it's, it's crushing your diaphragm. And she said, so you, she said, I won't be able to, to remove it, but you're going to have to have this surgically removed. And I said to her, please, if you can buy me some time, any amount of time, I'm in the natural health field. I need to be given a chance just to give it my best shot. And, and she said, well, Brandon, you contacted me because I don't have a tissue here. Sometimes when I go back to that time, I open into the consciousness of that time. And, the feelings that were there then come up now as if they're happening now. And so instead of crying out here, I cry out here. <laughs> Comes out my nose. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So here we go. Thank you. In, when I go to Japan, I'm not, never allowed to blow my nose. It's conceived, considered extremely impolite, and you lose a face <laughs> if you blow your nose. So excuse me, I'll dab. <laughs> so anyway. She, she, she said, the reason that you have contacted me is because you read from my book that I practice integrative medicine. And it's such a wonderful thing. Because right now, so many medical doctors are practicing integrative medicine, where they're integrating both the um, alternative or complementary medicine with their own allopathic practice. And, uh, but that wasn't so you know, 18 years ago. That wasn't the case. It was kind of rare. I mean, right now, I work with medical doctors and, and with hospitals and surgeons all around the world. But back then, it wasn't such a common thing. And she said, you, you've chosen me because I practice integrative medicine. And she said, attached to this clinic, we put people on herbs. We put them on cleanses. We uh, get the massages. We do, do guided visualizations. She said, we even do yoga and meditation. She said, if I thought you could go that route, that is the first route I would recommend. She said, but look at all these case studies here. She's not, there's not a single case study of a single woman who has had a mass that large, who has successfully healed herself. She said, so though I may wish you well, you need to get real. You need to get into the hospital today, get the further test done, test done so we can find out, is it malignant or benign? But ultimately, it's not going to matter. You're going to have to have this surgically removed. And after some time, I convinced her to, to give me some time. I said, listen, if through one of my techniques, I can get the bleeding to stop, how much time can you give me? And after about a 40-minute discussion, she agreed that if I could get the bleeding to stop over the next three days, she would give me exactly a month's time. Now, I agreed to that, because the truth is, I wanted to save my life. And for my own integrity, I had to be able to at least try to give it my best shot. And I walked outside of her, her offices, and it was in downtown LA. And I got to tell you something. You know, downtown LA, even though I'm a New Yorker, never been my favorite place is polluted and sprawling, and it's not homogenous, you know, many skins like we have in uh, New York City. It's, it's definitely not my favorite place. It's kind of a glossy place, very Hollywood, you know. And yet something happened to me that day that I will never forget. I stepped outside that her offices, and into the LA sunshine, and by this time I'd finally called my best friend up, and she was with me. And at this point, my mind, it was just reeling out of control, and my heart was pounding through the roof. And I stepped into that LA sunshine, and in front of me, there was a mimosa tree. 
It's a beautiful tree that we don't have here in this country. But it's a tree I hadn't even noticed going in. It had golden blossoms on it that looked like golden rain. And as I stepped outside, even though my mind was whirring out of control, I looked at this tree and I was stopped, absolutely arrested by its beauty. And my racing thinking mind, it just of its own accord slowly, slowly began to wind down in this timeless moment with a tree. And finally, it fell away into the background. And out of nowhere, waves of gratitude came. Gratitude for being allowed to see a beautiful tree. See that I'm allowed to see the color yellow and smell of fragrance that I had not smelled coming in to her offices. And as I just stood there looking at a tree, out of nowhere in the silence came a gut knowing. Somehow, I would be guided to heal. And I didn't have a clue what that was going to be. But I was so grateful at that time for the work of Dr. Deepak Chopra. Now, at that time, you got to know, 18 years ago, Chopra was not the guru he's become today. He was a medical surgeon, was working as chief surgeon general out of Boston Medical Hospital. And he'd done a radical thing. Not so radical now, but then, think back. Back then, the radical thing that he'd done is he decided that as a career study, he would study people who survived from serious illness without drugs or surgery. The reason this was so radical at that time is because all of us in the health field, and even today this is so, we're all taught, look at the symptoms that lead to ill health that ultimately lead to death. We all of us were focused on failure. But Chopra said, we know what makes people die. We already know that. I want to know what makes people heal. And so he amassed hundreds in what turned out to be thousands of case studies. And it, what he found is he could only find two qualities that all these case studies had in common. The successful survivors, through some act of grace or spontaneous event, they actually got access to this that he called the infinite intelligence of the body, the part of you that makes your heart beat and your eyes shine, your hair grow, and your cells replicate. The second thing that they had in common was that through some act of grace or spontaneous event, they actually got access to this that he called the cell memory. And what we know about the cells inside the body is they all, all cells, you know what, they replicate at varying speeds. So how many of you have ever had a suntan? Now I know because when I go to the continent in the summer, in Italy, in Spain, I see you guys there. So I gotta trust most of you have had a tan at some point or another. You're the first ones on the beach. How many of you ever had a tan? <laughs> How many of you ever noticed though, but notice, actually noticed this, clocked it, that, that your tan faded after about, um, uh, after about three weeks? How many of you noticed that? That's because it takes three weeks for the skin cells to regenerate. Liver cells take six weeks. Stomach lining, three days. It can be even less than that. And the one that just blows my mind, because if you touch your eyes, they feel like they're firm, don't they? I mean, they feel firm. But do you know that in less than 48 hours, you will have an all new eyeball? This is impossible for our thinking minds to even conceive of. And the only way I could put it into any context was some years ago, my mom had an eye operation where they slid her eye open, put a lens in, put the flap back, put a patch on, and only a day and a half later she could see clearly. That is how quickly the eye cells replicate. As a matter of fact, 
in a year's time, there will not be a single molecule in your body that was here today. You are literally all new. But Chopra was asking a question that no one else was asking. He was asking, well, if that's true, why is it that when you look at a liver that's, that's riddled with cancer in January, why would it be riddled with cancer in June? Good question to ask, since we know every six weeks it's all new liver. It's a good question to ask, isn't it? And what he postulated at that time, which has only subsequently been discovered by scientists working all around the world, in, out of Washington, D.C., with the American military, with the Russian military, is that stored inside our, our cells, what he, and what, you know, because we know the cells, they replicate, right? And what they found is that when you feel a strong emotion and you repress it, and they can watch this in the lab, this is irrefutable. <coughs> they can watch what happens to your biochemistry. If you feel a strong emotion and you repress it, it releases into our bloodstream a chemistry which will go to certain cell receptors and block them rendering those cells incapable of communicating with the rest of the cells in the body. And if over time, illness is going to happen in the body, the chances are it's going to happen where the cells are blocked, right? Conversely, what we also know is true is that when we feel our emotions openly and freely, our cell receptors remain open. And so what Chopra postulated in that time was stored inside these old degenerative cells were these old emotions, these old cell memories. And before that cell generation died, it passed on its consciousness and its, its uh, programming to the next cell generation. So the next cell generation was born as an exact replica of the previous cell generation. And so this emotional block these cell memory, memories get passed on from one cell generation to the next to the next. And what he found was that successful survivors had in common was that through some act of grace or spontaneous event, if they spontaneously went and got access to the consciousness stored inside the degenerative cell and somehow released it, when the new cell was born, it was born devoid of that old consciousness. So that he had amassed all these case studies. I'd seen many of them. I'd studied with Chopra, so I knew the possibility. But I've got to tell you something. You can know all the science on the planet. <laughs> you can see the case studies. You can understand the statistics. You can have even have seen what the blood looks like and seen the biochemistry. But unless you have a method it is nothing more than a wonderful science and an inspiring example of possibilities. Do you understand? That was where I stood. And so you can imagine, I had this knowing arise inside, inside of me that somehow I would be guided to heal. And so I'm not going to take you through my whole journey, but what I am going to tell you is this. I was put on a radical, spiritual, life-transforming journey. Part of the gift of that journey was I found a means for all of us, not just myself, but for people from all walks of life, from all different religions, from all different beliefs, to go on a direct, repeatable, very down-to-earth, very real, journey inside yourself, where you go inside the body and you uncover old cell memories, old emotional blocks, and you go through a, a process that you put yourself through with the support of someone else, a process of releasing what was stored there. You go through a process of forgiving, of letting go, so that when the new cells are born, 
they're born devoid of that old consciousness. And so the journey was born out of direct living experience. And what's happened since that was born, I, I had the feeling perhaps this didn't happen to me. I mean, mine was quite a radical journey. It took six and a half weeks for a basketball-sized tumor to leave. 